enhance community quarantine. And in this case, uh, if there are two cases in one building or a condo unit, then what will be locked down is the condo building itself. So mm -hmm. rather than closing or putting into ECQ or lockdown the whole uh, local government unit, uh, specifically the municipality or city, the locking down will now be uh, segmented depending on which specific areas. So in this case, a barangay, uh, subdivisions, uh, uh, buildings, or streets. So those are the segments that uh, the NTF are looking at. However, if there are more two or more cases in different barangays, then uh, we go back to locking down the specific or the specific local government unit, municipality or city. Okay, uh, I have to be fair. Sometimes kami sa media or ang balita na una sa gawa. Uh, you know, the news comes out first, uh, in, uh, uh, even before things are actually being implemented and being done. Now, my, my question to you is, uh, is there already, I've heard of this plan or these suggestions for, for about a month, but the question is, is there already a program in place with with uh, rules, with people, with strategies, because uh, in, in China, for instance, they lock you in your apartment. They bring you to a quarantine center. If you pass the quarantine center, they take you to your apartment and lock you down in your apartment or in your flat. That's for uh, that. That's just to to make sure you don't have COVID-19. If you have COVID-19, they bring you to a hospital and test everyone in, in the house or in the family. Now, here with this pronouncement, uh, na ba tayong, is this just a suggestion, idea, uh, policy, or is there already a system behind this policy? Well, first of all, it was approved by the IATF last week as presented by Secretary Galvez. No? It mm. actually formalized what we have been doing already in the past. Yeah. Uh, it, it put in rules, and uh, you were saying a while ago there are now rules when there is what we call a segmentalized uh, lockdown. Uh, yeah. Prior to that, uh, uh, certain cities have done their own uh, lockdowns, specifically barangays, subdivisions. Uh, Quezon City, as, as I remember, as early as March, late March, they had to uh, put under extreme ECQ two or three barangays at that time. I was involved mm. with the process of having it locked down. So these are things that have been uh, been present uh, all the while, but right now it's being formalized into a policy. There are now certain rules and criteria, and you're right, uh, once a specific area has been uh, locked down, meron na gagawin niya na testing. Lalahat, test na lahat. So meron na tayong mm. rules. Unlike before, kanya-kanya ang local government units. But uh, okay. this thing is no longer new. Uh, it's just being formalized into a formal policy to be implemented yeah. by the Asia Task Force. Yeah, my, my, my problem with that, Yusek Densing, is napakalawak. It's such a broad uh, menu of options because as you pointed out, there are some barangay, they will lock down the street. According yeah. to Yusek uh, Dino, they would uh, lock down the sitio. But now we're talking, you know, entire buildings and entire barangays or private villages where only two cases, a minimum of two cases occur. Now, people might argue na, ano ba? If you know that there are only two cases, then concentrate, isolate those two cases, remove the patients, test the people, but don't further punish so more, so many people. I, I guess what I'm getting at, you Densing, is can we get specifics on how this rule is going to be applied? Because uh, depending kung sino ka usap namin, iba ang version or iba ang strategy. Yeah, uh, meron talaga rules. Kaya nga nung tinesent yan, pinakita talaga. So halimbawa sa street, dalawa nga lang yan, ano? But mm -hmm. uh, again, that the two cases, for instance, in one street, will event. Yeah. Uh, there's an epidemiologist uh, uh, input that it can actually spread. That's why it's mm. important that kung, kung dalawa sa isang street, then the whole street should be locked down. And yes, Fine. there will be testing. Everybody will be tested. And uh, there's a period of time, I think 7 to 14 days, uh, before the lockdown will be lifted. Because again, pag nakita yung uh, dalawang cases na yon, sa Saraybong Street, the street will now be assisted by the local government unit in terms of their food and essentials. 
And then lahat babantayan, we have a barangay health uh, emergency response team to, to monitor the situation. Then once the, the two cases uh, have already lapsed, in others after 14 days, well, nakita na po natin na uh, wala na po silang infection at uh, mm. nakita rin natin through mass testing, wala na rin infection yung mga kapitbahay, then that's the only time that the street will be opened again. Same thing in buildings. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, the, the, we are able to contain the virus. That's the ultimate objective, no? And, and this yeah. is better. This is better than uh, than locking down a, a municipality or a city. So we have yeah. a segmentation, and uh, while certain segments of a specific LGU will be locked down, tuloy ang buhay or economic activities naman sa labas nito. Okay, so obviously this thing has to be really uh, fine, uh, has to be threshed out finely kasi may mga tao rin na magsasabi, teka, teka, uh, tatlong buwan na kaming naka-detain sa mga bahay namin, nagkamali yung kabilang kalsada, pati kami damay. In any case, uh, I, I trust the DILG will look further into this because as I've always said, while we may not always agree in policy, uh, I can I can fairly say that the government has been responsive and listens to suggestions, yeah. even yeah. criticism. In any, case, yeah, in any case, Yusek, uh, may, may I ask uh, on the other uh, area of interest or concern and confusion, itong travel passes. Kasi nagkakalito-lito na talaga uh, what is allowed and what is not allowed. And I have to be honest, uh, Yusek, yeah. no? uh, when I heard the word travel pass, alam mo, naalala ko yung martial law eh, when uh, my father had to go to the NICA, the National Intelligence uh, Agency, uh, para lang makapunta kami ng Baguio or makapunta kami ng Tagaytay, eh, magpapaalam kami sa military. Ngayon, uh, paano ba ang setup? How is the setup as far as travel passes go? And what is allowed in terms of travel under GCQ? Okay, first of all, uh, we've already identified specific industries and businesses that may be open no, under a GCQ setup. So if you are a worker or a, uh, under the specific establishments of businesses, you don't need a travel pass. You only hmm. need to show your company ID or a certificate of employment or proof of employment and the address of the office. So no travel pass needed for specific uh, businesses already open, the employees specifically. However, if you are going to move from one province to another where you will be moving for a non-essential movement, for instance, bibisita ka lang sa iyong kamag-anak, that's the only time you will apply for a travel pass. So mm -hmm. in the, the whole system of getting a travel pass, the specific LGUs have already set up a one-stop center Nandun na po yung uh, what we call the community health officials and the uh, Philippine National Police kasi sila po ang mag-i-issue ng travel pass. So bago pa lumabas, pupunta ka lang sa LGU mo, i-check up ka kung uh, meron kang symptoms. Kung wala kang symptoms, you'll be issued a health certificate. Then with that health certificate, the uh, chief of police or the PNP in that area will now issue a travel pass for you. Very specific po yung time frame ng travel pass. Uh, kailan ka papasok, kailan ka lalabas. Uh, again, these are only for non-essential movements of people. That's why people are still discouraged no, to go out and remain at home. Okay, so uh, if, let's say, like me, I am 64 years old, I am a senior citizen, but I am a functioning employed senior citizen, or some of my friends who own companies and run corporations, they can issue themselves corporate ID or get a uh, company ID and travel and go to work. Correct, correct. That's right. That's okay. right. If you're a senior citizen uh, and you're uh, you're part of the industry that has been opened up for for economic activity, you don't need a travel pass. You only need to show your ID, uh, certificate of employment in the checkpoints. Then you can go to work. And the same the same applies, I I suppose, for people who are below twenty one. Yung mga eighteen to twenty one na namamasukan din, kasi maraming ganyan na may mga asawa na, may mga anak na at 2021 na namamasukan and talagang uh, apektado sila by the below 21 uh, no travel uh, rule. Well, unfortunately, dun sa below 21, walang exemption. No? Unlike sa senior citizen, pag working ka, uh, you're, you're allowed. Unfortunately, hindi yung naging exemption sa below 21. No? 
Uh, even, however, if they have, even if they are legitimately employed and working, because, you know, uh, that, that's a very touchy point, uh, Yusek then Singh, kasi marami dyan mga busboys, dishwasher, mga nagtatrabaho sa mga laborer. Uh, legitimate. I'm not talking about those who are not employed. Well, the assumption of those below 21 kasi is ano eh, they are students, no? Uh, hindi pa nag-aaral. But again, maybe I can raise that as an issue dun sa below yeah. 21. Kasi ang kumingi talaga ng exemption is yung senior citizens na uh-huh. employed sila. That's why that exception was given to them. Yung below 21, yeah. unfortunately, hindi po yan na-tackle. Uh, but uh, we'll see. We, we can raise it for those uh, working which is below 21. Because again, at the end of the day, uh, and even under GCQ, people really are still discouraged to go out, specifically yung below 21 and yung 60 and above. And even between 21 to 59, kung non-essential naman yung, yung paggalaw, we still discourage you to go out. In other words, bahay pa rin tayo, kaya nga tayo naka-general quarantine. The only reason why we allowed specific industries to operate because uh, we have to promote already economic activity slowly. Because mm-hmm. uh, remember, your first quarter GDP natin was negative 0.2. Our first uh, retraction of our GDP in 22 years. So yeah. kailangan mo natin gumalaw yung ating ekonomiya. Kaya nga very specific industries na pinapayagan magbukas. Alam mo, Yusek Densing, uh, nung umpisa, when I first heard about you, I thought you were a contrabida. But then I realized you are simply a very outspoken person who speaks his mind. And that's why I'm glad I'm speaking to you today. Because I know you will uh, you will share what we have shared with you this morning tungkol dun sa plight ng no mga 18 to 21. Kasi ang dami sa kanila na talagang worker, laborer, uh, employee na may mga anak na. Alam mo naman na meron tayong problema sa mga ganyan dito sa Pilipinas and, and they need to support their families. Now, uh, an- another uh, area that uh, I wanted to ask, ask you about is the Yung mga stranded ba dito sa Metro Manila? Kasi uh, napolitika yung balik probinsya na yan eh. Uh, it became a political issue now. Pero hindi na-address itong mga na-stranded. Marami pa rin stranded, hindi makalabas ng Metro Manila, uh, nasa gilid-gilid. And, and I've spoken to several mayors and sabi nila, sito, there's a number of backdoor uh, entries and uh, we need to legitimize this movement, a return of uh, of people to the provinces, na, not Balik Provincia, but people who are just stranded and wanted want to get out of Metro Manila. Uh, what is the uh, DILG planning to do about that? Kasi stranded pa rin sila, walang benepisyo dito, walang suporta. Uh, anong gagawin natin sa kanila? I clear ko muna no yung Balik Probinsya program which was uh, under executive order number 114 is a different program altogether. Pag natin yeah. to i pag natin to ihalo dito sa locally stranded individuals nor dito yeah. sa Balik uh, OFW no. So that's a separate thing. Uh, yes, uh, j- just uh, before we talk er- uh, today, a uh, few hours back I was talking to one of our officials in the regions and yes, there are people who are who used to be locally stranded who are doing some backdoor uh travel to their provinces kasi na ikit niya. But uh, we already have a process for locally stranded individuals. As early as uh, uh, three weeks ago, may process na po tayo that the locally stranded individual can just go to the barangay. Pupunta lang siya doon para humingi ng certification na LSI siya at hihingi ng certification na matagal 14 days or more na siya uh, kumbaga naka-quarantine doon sa pinagkakatirahan niya sa barangay. Pagkatapos, mm-hmm. pupunta lang ho siya sa munisipyo or sa city hall Naka-prepare na ho yung ating mga uh, health officials. Again, titingnan lang yung katawan mo, uh, i-check up ka lang na wala kang symptoms ng uh, virus at uh, issuean ka na ng health certificate. And with that document, you can go to the DILG uh, help desk no? and papakita mo lang yung health certificate. They will assist you in getting your uh, travel authority to return to your province, uh, which is uh, again issued by the Philippine National Police in joint uh, uh, joint COVID task force. So mabilis yung proseso. In fact, sometimes some of them get the, those uh, the documents half a day. Then nakakawi na sila na, the next day. Ang naging problema lang natin noong una sito is ano, sasakyan. Kasi, mm. ba, although sinusundo individually, 
eh, merong dalawa, tatlo pupunta sa isang probinsya, hindi naman po practical na kumuha ng bus para sila yung uwi. So, nagkaroon lang tayo ng problema uh, initially on that stage. Pero ngayon, nagawa na rin ng na paraan ng DOTR. Some of our locally stranded individuals have started to go home. Although, uh, meron out of Metro Manila para makauwi na sa kanilang mga probinsya. Okay, well, what, what are we doing regarding the border patrols? Para na tayong ano eh, para na tayong uh, ibang bansa eh, may kanya-kanya ng border. Uh, because uh, there are reports that uh, some, OF, some OFWs have been denied entry. I re- read up a story where an OFW spent two months when you totaled all the places and days of quarantine he was required to undergo from from abroad from one country to another country to the Philippines to the province uh, sabi niya nakaya dalawang buwan lang naman ho ako dun sa mga quarantine quarantine na yan uh, what are we doing about provinces town cities na eh, may sariling patakaran who have their own quarantine policies well hindi po uh, first of all uh all the OFWs which were sent home in the last seven days, no, 25,000 of them, all of them were accepted by the LGU. Okay. We didn't have received any reports that we rejected. Otherwise, I would have sent a letter, uh, a show post letter to the LGU which rejected the OFWs. So nobody was rejected. The only okay. policy we have to uh, respect, no, that each LGU have their, has their own uh, health protocol that we have to respect. So there are not not all no, but there are specific or certain LGUs that once you uh, arrive at their LGU, they will give you certain health protocols such as another quarantine. No? Uh, mm. But what is important, and this is uh, this is where the OFWs appreciate the situation, is baka quarantine uli sila sa LGU for another seven to fourteen days. Pero dun na sa barangay na kung saan malapit yung kanilang bahay. So ang kanilang appreciation is. Okay na lang ako dito sa barangay mag-quarantine at least malapit na ako sa kamag-anak ko, sa pamilya ko. Pwede nila akong dalawin. And again, mm-hmm. the accommodation and food of these uh, quarantine areas in the LGU are to be shouldered by the LGU. So wala rin silang babayaran. Uh, it's basic health protocol naman that we have to respect the LGU. Others, diretso na sa home quarantine, bin- binabantayan na lang ng barangay health uh, emergency uh, response team. Yung iba naman, tinanggap without any... Uh, conditions ng LGU. So kanya-kanya. And we have to respect the LGUs to protect also their their uh, their areas from potential uh, uh, infections of this virus. So uh, mm-hmm. we didn't hear, hear any any rejections. Uh, otherwise, uh, mapipitik sila sa tenga. Pero may nadinig kasi ako. And, and that, this is what I was referring to, yung napolitika, yung balik probinsya, Yusek Densing. No? Uh, I, I, read the, I read the report where there were at least two cases of balik provincia individuals who tested positive parang uh, i don't i don't know kung nakalusot sila o hindi sila na test during the screening uh, what what about those uh, concerns yung mga OFW or balik provincia lahat ba sila na test and do the barangays or local governments have at the minimum rapid testing kits well i'm confirming that all 25000 which were sent home were all PCR, RT-PCR tested, and they were all tested negative. So in other words, may dala-dala sila ng testo. Yes. Na negative yung OFW. Sila. So, okay. OFW. Uh, ngayon, uh, minsan dumadating mo sila dahil sa may mga, may mga LGU na merong health protocol na itetest ka pa rin. So there are LGUs na nagra-rapid confirm that there are uh, rapid test uh, testings happening in certain LGUs. Yung iba uh-huh. naman, tinatanggap na as is yung, yung PCR test. Yung iba nagpapapisya at test pa uli, no? Uh, hmm. Doon sa mga can afford no, to do that. And of course, pag na-PCR test ka, the quarantine period is shorter, 3 to 5 days lang. Pag nag-negative okay. ka na, uwi ka na. Okay, well, uh, I think we've cleared up quite a, a lot of uh, questions uh, this morning. And please, paki, paabot na lang po sa ano, paabot na lang po sa IATF yung uh, problema ng mga 21 to 18 years old na nagtatrabaho na hindi makatrabaho. In any case, thank you very much, Yusek Densing, for your time today. Please stay strong, stay safe, and uh, stay healthy. God bless you.
Thank you, Sito. Good morning and uh, likewise to you. Okay, that's uh, our undersecretary at the DILG. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I have to figure out Epimaco. Yeah, yeah. I, I keep because uh, uh, his uh, name is uh, strong. His family name is so strong. I always think Yusek Densing, but he is uh, Epimaco Densing of the DILG. Now, from uh, from the uh, USEC, let's go now to our friend in the PNP, uh, po <clears throat> Police Lieutenant General Guillermo Eliazar, Deputy Chief for Operations of the Philippine National Police. He is also the Task Force Commander for uh, Task Force COVID Shield. Uh, General Eliazar, good morning to you, sir. Yes, good morning, Sito. And uh, magandang araw din sa lahat ng mga nakikinig at nanonood oh. sa inyong programa. Okay. Uh, first question, I suppose, would be the uh, plans for checkpoints. Kasi we are now nasa GCQ na tayo. And uh, balitaan ko na may balak kayo or may pinag-iisipan na uh, bawasan na yung mga checkpoints or bumalik tayo dun sa sistema ninyo na palipat-lipat ang checkpoints. Yes, Sito. Uh, when we transitioned from uh, ACQ to MECQ, and that was uh, uh, more than two weeks uh, ago, nagkaroon na tayo ng alam natin na on that uh, transition, marami na ang mga permitted industries. At uh, kung maraming permitted industries na mag-ooperate, napakaraming mga authorized persons na lalabas sila ay part ng workforce. And consequently, maraming sakyan. Kaya nga, hindi practical, lalo na sa Metro Manila and other highly urbanized areas, that we will flag down all vehicles na dadaan sa checkpoint natin. It will uh, uh, defeat the purpose of this uh, partial reopening of the economy. That is why uh, ang ginawa natin, random checking na lang. So, ibig sabihin nun, hindi lahat doon tapos mm -hmm. na 10 o 20 vehicle, pagkatapos kung tukod na, i-release and mag-check ulit. Pero tatandaan natin na du during this random uh, checking, including itong ginagawa ng high patrol group na... Uh, mobile checkpoint, itong Oakland Sita and Oakland Habol, pag kayo inatapat sa random checking, properly ang gagawin natin yan. At uh, kung mayroong violation dyan, eh siyempre, titikita natin at uh, sasampahan natin ng appropriate case. Dahil we want to give uh, this uh, mindset sa ating mga kabayan na uh, hindi kami nagluwag. Nagbigyan mm -hmm. na tayo ng operasyon dahil we have to balance uh, this situation at uh, ayun naman natin na magkaka that this will result to uh, you know, uh, monstrous traffic na mag-create na ng uh, malaking problema sa kalsada. And ganun din ang ginagawa natin now that we are in GCQ. But uh, on other places, even though uh, GCQ pa rin yan, pero kung it could be managed, the traffic na tadaan dyan, pwede pa rin naman na i-check lahat. Depende yan sa discretion and the uh, assessment ng ating unit commanders in the ground. Okay, there, there is quite a widespread impression na dumami daw ang number ng motorsiklo na dagdag pa yung bilang ng mga bisikleta. Now, can you confirm this na mukhang dumami nga talaga, mas dumami pa ang motorsiklo ngayon? Sito, the, the fact that uh, we opened uh, the economy at uh, mas marami na ang uh, permitted industries, eh marami po sa ating mga kabayan na workers ay gumagamit ng motorsiklo. So talagang tama yan. Uh, that is at just, uh, hindi lang siya logical, pero talagang uh, ganun talaga yung nakita natin. And the others are using bicycles. Uh, mm -hmm. Pero sinasabi nga natin na dapat kung gagamitin nyo itong mga means of transportation na ito na allowed naman, authorized person kayo in the first place. So what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say, Sito, is that ang allowed dapat sa labas ay mga authorized person. And basically, ito mga authorized persons na ito, ito yung mga workers ng mga permitted industries na hindi yeah. na kailangan pa ang quarantine pass, hindi na kailangan pa ang anumang mga uh, uh, identification except basic ID. And by the way, Sito, even sa ECQ yun naman yung ating uh, uh, patakaran dun eh, uh, pagkapatunan mm -hmm. na you are part of the uh, workforce of permitted industry, sapat na yun. Kung may rapid pass ka at nasa NCR, better kasi mas mabilis ang processing nun. And kung may ITF card naman, maganda rin. Pero kung wala naman, ID and certificate of employment uh, will do. And the quarantine pass, kagaya na pagiliwanag ka natin, hindi naman talaga siya ginagamit sa mga checkpoint. Kasi basically, 
you cannot cross the checkpoint with just quarantine pass dahil usually nasa border itong mga checkpoint natin. Checkpoint. And may mga quarantine pass, it is used during ECQ to determine sino ba yung isa, one household, na pwedeng lumabas at mag na goods and services na offered by the permitted industries. And basically, kahit nun pa man, ka lang sa ere mo. At kahit na nasa GCQ na tayo ngayon, uh, you should avail this product kain, damit,
it's no different for your police officers. Uh, yung bang mga yan ay eh, nararapid test natin on a regular basis. Tama yan, Sito. Kaya nga, dahil sa effort ng uh, ating CPNP Police General Archie Gamboa, eh kami po ay nakapag-procure na nitong uh, RT-PCR facility uh, dito po sa loob ng Camp Rame. At ang mm. gawin niyang procurement dito para po sa Visayas and Mindanao. For the rapid uh, uh, test naman, sinagawa na po yan. Pero syempre, hindi man pwedeng lahat masubject dyan na protocol at binigyan ng priority uh, itong mga personal na kailangang mauna. And sa ngayon, we have uh, uh, more than enough Quarantine facility, in fact, kung tinitingnan lang po namin, eh, talagang hindi po nagagamit ang uh, siguro 90% or more than 90% of the facilities that we have prepared for our personnel that could be affected by this uh, virus. At salamat sa Diyos, ganun naman. But just the same, we have more than 300 uh, positive hmm. cases of uh, uh, COVID-19 among our personnel and uh, more than 1,000 na iba pa under uh, uh, monitoring. But just the same, just like what you have said, Naging bahagi po yan ng effort ng ating PNP leadership with the creation of a, a task force on administrative uh, aspect that support our operational function in order to sustain what we're doing even beyond uh, this uh, quarantine period. Okay. Uh, nung uh, ECQ, MECQ, natutuwa tayong lahat kasi bumaba ang crime incidents. Eh, itong GCQ, eh, sa bagay, dadalo, we've only had two days under GCQ. But there is, uh, I think, a valid concern na uh, with people being able to go out, uh, the incidence of crime could go up. Do you, for, do you see that happening? Or uh, meron pa rin, pa rin namang uh, uh, tawag nito, curfew? Well, Sito, given all things equal, it's logical na pagdami ng tao sa labas, pagbalik ng ekonomiya, so pa uh, posibleng tumaas natin dahil the two basic uh, elements for a crime to be committed is motive and opportunity. Hmm. Yung motive, wala natin magawa dyan pag utok kriminal. Talagang uh, mahirap maguhin. Pero oportunidad, eh, talagang it will open that window of opportunity dito sa situation ng GCQ compared with the uh, ECQ. But just uh, the same, nakalatag naman po yung ating mga police intervention na nakita nating effective uh, for the past uh, 78 days. In fact, based on our monitoring nga, di ba nakita natin, talaga ang laki na binaba, 58% ang binaba ng, uh, ng uh, focus crime for index crime, which is the barometer of peace and order on this uh, period compared hindi to na, uh, ano, period hindi. last time. Pero pwedeng tumaas na ito. Kaya lang, yun nga si ito, dahil meron tayong mga checkpoint operation, andun ang mga police natin for visibility on uh, permitted establishment that are operating now and the checkpoint na mandated pa rin sa omnibus guideline na during this uh, community quarantine period, ang ating po mga LGU ay patuloy pa rin na mag implement ng mga pinasan nilang ordinansa uh, pertaining mm -hmm. to curfew only for non-workers during night time. Okay, uh, last two questions, General, kasi alam ko meron ka pang uh, kasunod na interview. Uh, one question is, yung bang mga PNP personnel papagamit or makikipag-coordinate uh, uh, sa mga LGUs para sila ang mga mag-inspeksyon ng mga business uh, establishments that will be opened or are being opened under GCQ. Because uh, in some areas, they much prefer that the police be the one to go to those uh, establishments and sit manita ng mga sum uh, hindi sumusunod sa social distancing. Yes, ito. Uh, may, may coordination ang ginawa dyan. Uh, before tayo mag-open for GCQ, our police uh, units, particularly here in RCRPO, nagsagawa na po ng mga consultation and dialogues with other stakeholders, not just the mall and the uh, establishment management, pati na rin sa LGU, lalo na po sa LGU. And mm. uh, alam naman natin lahat, just like what you have said, itong PNP napakahalaga na gamitin sa mga bagay na ito para magkaroon tayo ng magandang enforcement. At yun po ang ating ginagawa sa kayon. Our uh, SILG, General Ed Anyo, has given instruction na ang police, even though hindi naman kami magbabantay sa lahat ng mga yan, pero we should monitor their compliance, particularly ito mga measures na provide ng ating uh, DTI uh, through the IATF para po sa mga minimum requirements, itong fiscal distancing, pati na rin po yung wearing of a social mask, and the number of uh, allowed or maximum 
customers na pwedeng pumasok sa isang establishment para mas madali nating ma-enforce itong mga minimum health protocols na ito. Okay, last question, General. Ito pong uh, curfew. May mga nagsasabi. Kasi ako, hindi talaga ako lumalabas. Eh. Nakakatulugan ko na nga si Presidente pag nagsasalita siya dahil maaga ako matulog ngayon. But uh, may curfew pa ba? And kung sakasakaling we go back to normal, would you recommend that we do a curfew on bars and uh, the consumption of alcohol like they do in uh, other countries and even in the U.S. where after 2 o'clock, sarado na ang mga bars and uh, hindi na pwede magbenta ng alak para maiwasan yung mga vehicular accidents, dri- uh, driving while under the influence, etc. Yes, ito. Para sa kalaman ng ating mga kababayan, yung pong ating curfew ay locally uh, enforced or uh, initiated. So, kaya nga, pag ako tinatanong ano bang oras sa mga curfew, depende po sa LGU yan sa cities. Before the ECQ, nag-usap-usap through the Metro Manila Council, itong mga city mayor sa atin dito, na nag-usap sila na at least covered yung from 8 in the evening, at least 5 in the morning, pero iba rin 24 hours. So nasa kanila po yan. Pwede po sila mag-adjust at dapat it is uh, the responsibility of uh, the residents of the place or yung mga dadaan dyan na alam natin itong mga curfew hours. And ipatutupad pa rin yan. Kaya lang, sinasabi nga natin na if you are part of the uh, authorized persons outside residents or yung mga workers, exempted po kayo basically sa curfew kung kayo pa iuuwi or papunta sa inyong pinagtatrabuhan or in line with work yung inyong uh, travel at nasa labas. And just like what I've said, mandated po ito habang meron tayong community quarantine. And even beyond that, as long as wala pa tayong uh, vaccine na, na nahahanap, ay eh, yun po yung aming nakikita at aming nire-recommend na patuloy pa rin tayong merong curfew sa gabi for non-workers uh, para po mas lalo nating ma-restrict ang move, unnecessary movement ng ating mga kababayan at the same time, mapatuloy nating ma-suppress or ma-control ang commission ng crime sa ating kapaligiran. Okay, thank you very much sa uh, Police Lieutenant General uh, Eliazar and uh, maraming salamat. Mabuti naman ang kaliwanagan and uh, please stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy and uh, pakishare na lang dun sa mga makakamiting ninyo yung mga concerns namin. Uh, God bless you, sir. Maraming salamat, Sito. Magandang umaga sa ating lahat. Mabuhay po kayo. Okay, that's uh, Police Lieutenant General Guillermo Eliazar. He is the uh, task force commander for COVID Shield 19. And uh, uh, we will now go for a uh, quick break and uh, we will uh, return uh, with uh, our next guest here on Agenda. Okay, you're back here on Agenda. I'm Sito Beltran, and you are watching us via Signal TV, Channel 8 and 250. And in uh, this part of the show, we want to bring into you the representatives of Cebu Pacific, as well as Air Asia, to discuss the uh, situation of Philippine aviation and uh, commerce. We have with us Charo Logarta for Cebu Pacific, 
and I will see if we do a panel there. And David De Castro or David De Castro, spokesperson for Air Asia. Good morning to both of you. Good morning, Sita, and good morning, Dave. Good morning to all of your viewers. Sito, hey, good morning, Sarah. Hello, nice to see Hello. you again. Okay, uh, let's uh, start uh, ladies first and then uh, David just uh, follow suit. Uh, yesterday, I was monitoring a uh, news report from abroad, uh, actually France 24, and it was announced that the European Union plus the IATA and the, uh, uh, what's that organization for uh, airlines, uh, uh, they they had issued guidelines for international travel. But here in the Philippines, we're kind of like, uh, I think, in limbo. What is the situation for Cebu Pacific, uh, Charo? Well, for now, uh, well, today we are... Uh... We are restarting or we are uh, doing some uh, domestic flights uh, for today. Very limited number of flights uh, for domestic. And the intention is to gradually restart our domestic route network depending on uh, two things. One is approval of the IATF and two, whether the LGU or the local government unit concerned will approve or will be okay with us. Uh, bringing in passengers via air travel uh, to their uh, destinations or to their localities. Uh, and so for today, we have uh, three routes that we are starting today. Um, that's General mm -hmm. Santos, Naga, and Cagayan de Oro. Mm -hmm. And then over the coming days, we will be working with the IATF and the LGU so that we can add to these flights or add the number of routes. So it's Jensan, Naga, and... Cagayan de Oro. <clears throat> okay, uh, CDO. Now, what about you guys, David? Uh, are you mounting flights uh, this week or what's the situation? Yes, actually, Sito, uh, the original uh, resumption date of Air Asia supposedly today also, but you know, after new developments from our coordination with local government units, at the same time, to give our guests more time to be able to consolidate all their needed travel documents, we have decided to move our resumption date to uh, this Friday, June 5. So uh, Friday, June 5, we will be flying to, uh, let me check that, we will be flying to uh, Cebu as well as uh, Cagayan de Oro. So we will be having 10 flights in total starting this Friday. But of course, we do also understand that some LGUs would eventually be opening up their local airports as well. Uh, that is why in the succeeding days, we do expect more flights to be mounted by Air Asia also. So by June 8 and by June 11, we will be having flights going to, to Davao as well as uh, Puerto Princesa. Uh, but I hope our guests also understand that uh, these are things that eventually are, uh, that, that are developing. You know, so things may change uh, in the process. But nevertheless, we are always at 24-7, always informing our guests also of okay. the changes in the flights <clears throat> that happen, uh, as well as uh, with the new guidelines that we receive from the government. Okay, Charo, uh, what, are the, what were the <coughs> conditions or requirements of the uh, local governments? Because uh, uh, just from uh, the OFW issue, the uh, uh, land-based uh, transfers, etc., some uh, local governments were a pain in the butt as far as uh, their requirements are concerned. Now, what were the rules or what are the rules that uh, the local governments Im imposed to allow you to fly into their areas? Well, it varies from LGU to, to LGU, but um, as a general rule of thumb, that would include, of course, that they uh, making sure that the airlines uh, were implementing all possible preventive measures. Um, and this also includes requirements uh, that they asked us to to you know, have passengers present, um, which uh, we, which would include primarily proof that they are not traveling for leisure and that their purpose of travel is either to come go back home or for work or official business, which means, you know, proof of uh, working like certificate of employment, valid ID, so on and so forth. And uh, in some cases, uh, some LGUs require a medical certificate or medical clearance. 
Okay, now, uh, are you required to do rapid testing before departure, uh, David? Uh, let me point to now, Sito, that the restrictions really are not necessarily pointed towards the, the airlines, but these restrictions are really more for uh, flying guests. Uh, that is why we advise our guests to please uh, always check for the local uh, travel guidelines of the LGUs that they are flying to. So for, for example, there are some LGUs that require uh, travel passes and uh, more medical certificates. However, there are also other LGUs that are, let's say, more lenient, uh, perhaps based on the cases that they have, uh, which are very minimal in their area. So some of these LGUs do not require our guests to have uh, travel passes anymore. But nevertheless, uh, these are the basics, a travel uh, pass from uh, the DILG or the PLP, a medical certificate. Uh, this medical certificate does not necessarily reflect that the status of this particular passenger is positive or negative for a test. It only states that, you know, uh, this certain guest, the certain person already underwent certain uh, quarantine processes just to make sure that uh, the temperature readings also during that uh, quarantine period was also at the low or hindi mataas, walang lagnat yung pasaherong ito. So okay. these all uh -uh. Ch Charo, how, how does this affect uh, or complicate the business? Because I I'm sorry, okay? I mean, uh, I don't do business with you guys, but if I were with you, I would really be upset by the fact that there is no uniform policy. Uh, does the is there no government body who can basically set the rules? Uh, CAB, CAAP, or IATF? Para kasi parang ano ito hula hula. If I want to go to a province, I have to check first uh, kung mako confine na ko don or mako quarantine ako. Parang travel at your own risk and travel at your own inconvenience. Well, uh, I think we have to understand, Sito, that um, this COVID-19 pandemic is really unprecedented. And no, nobody was prepared for this, not the private sector and not government. And um, understandably, um, governments both at the national and local go uh, levels, not just here in the Philippines, but even in other countries, are, are grappling with solutions to prevent further contamination and to, to basically protect their constituents. And um, I think the reaction of uh, the government uh, with all of these uh, different precautionary measures um, at the local and national level are understandable uh, given this situation. But having said that, um, yes, we there. it would be ideal if we had some guidelines. For instance, um, how do we clearly define what is leisure and non-leisure travel? Um, at this point in time, we only have a, a general idea of it, but for uh, specific circumstances, we have to sort of uh, make a discernment or a judgment call uh, for uh, with our passengers. And um, it would be ideal to have these uh, clearer guidelines, uh, but we are working with the government uh, so that we could come up with these uh, clarifications. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm really shaking my head because uh, David, uh, Charo, no, uh, uh, free, free for all na lang tayo, so it doesn't appear like a QA. and a Because, uh, I mean, I, I, I feel bad for your companies. You're providing a service, a vital service, and, and yet here we go. Uh, are you telling me, Charo, uh, David, that if someone lies, if someone lies and says, oh, I am going there on official business, yung pala ang official business niya, girlfriend niya, or, or barkada niya, whatever at the beach, uh, is the airline held responsible? That's a very concern, you know, Sito. That is why right now we, we, there is really a heightened, uh, let's say, coordination with the government when it comes to how do we screen our passengers. And these are some items really that are ending clarification also as we resume our operations i would have to be honest these are confusing times for not just the airlines but also for our flying guests and perhaps also for the other industries that are already operating under gsq but nevertheless we want to work together with the government you know to be able to manage this public health situation 
And at the same time, we ask for guidance on how are we going to impl implement these uh, these new guidelines that they have been issuing also. So at least for, for the aviation sector, the OTR has really also ironed out certain guidelines on how we will be doing this. But in terms of uh, making sure that our guests also follow uh, these guidelines, these are this is an area that we, we would want to ask for the support from government. So how do we okay. implement this at the airport? At uh, the check-in counter, we would have to check also whatever documents our guests have, you know. But uh, perhaps as a secondary screening, we would request our government partners also to, you know, be there also with us as we also ask our guests as they fly to the different uh, provinces here in the country. Okay, we don't have a lot of time, so maybe I should just highlight on the positive things and I will I will keep my editorial to myself for later. Now, uh, Charo, uh, as far as Cebu Pacific is concerned, I heard a story, I, I hope it's true, that the senior executives up to middle management of Cebu Pacific all volunteered or agreed to take salary cuts, salary deductions or reductions in order for other employees to be able to save their jobs. How true is this story? Um, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we all had to take a uh, pay cut, uh, the, the, the management level, uh, depending on your position or your 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 rank, rather. Um, so that's a sort, sort of like a socialized or a bracketed uh, percentage of salary deduction and whatever was deducted from the salaries, yes, would be used to, to help sustain or augment the, uh, the wages of our other colleagues. Okay, well, uh, bravo to all of you because uh, that, that is uh, such a uh, noble thing to do and it is something that should be uh, repeated and uh, mentioned to others, especially our viewers. Now, David, for Air Asia, I, I do know that your organization heavily invested in, uh, in the company just before COVID-19. You had big, great plans. And then uh, COVID-19 happens. How are you guys coping with this uh, challenge? Right. Uh, it's, it's actually a challenge for a low-cost airline already to continue, you know, keeping costs at the low. So the, the challenge really here is for, for the company to be efficient, to continue its efficiency in, in its operations and at the same time be innovative. You know, in terms of efficiency, we have really scrubbed our budgets just to make sure that uh, our money goes to the uh, important aspect of our operation. So, for example, we had to lessen our advertising costs just to make sure that the money we save will be able to be used in, uh, for example, the maintenance of our aircraft. You know, in terms of innovation, we always have to be, you know, to, to see the silver lining despite this crisis. That is why... Uh, in the midst of this uh, uh, poor commercial passenger pickup of our sales, we, we, we had to look for other sources of demand as well. So uh, those other sources of demand continue to be our special recovery or repatriation flights. And at the same time, uh, our cargo operations remain unhappered. So th these are some of the areas where our attention uh, is really going to right now just to make sure that you know the business continues just to make sure also that our employees remain on board and you know and hopefully we are able to to bounce back you know once uh the situation already comes down a bit okay uh charo what what are the plans or what are the aspirations of uh cebu pacific as far as the near future is concerned because I mean, you know, if we listen to all the predictions and all the business analysis, it's like, uh, I, I won't even go there. It, it's just too depressing. But uh, you guys seem to be uh, fighting it out, slugging it out, and, and doing everything to, to keep, to stay in the fight. W what is the future like as far as uh, travel is concerned and for, the, for your millions of uh, patrons? 
Well, two things. One is that when Cebu Pacific uh, came into this COVID-19 uh, situation, we were coming from a very strong 2019. So we, we have some resources to, to help us cope with this pandemic. Number two is that, you know, Sito, um, for, for many of us who are of a certain age, um, this is not the first time that the global aviation industry has faced uh, such a situation. If you remember 2001, when 9-11 happened, um, that really shook the aviation industry globally. Um, and a lot of the measures that we had uh, been protesting, like removing the shoes, if you recall, uh, going through multiple x-rays and checks. These are all born from 9-11. And yet we accepted it over time as a new normal. And it's the same thing today. Um, over time, we will accept the heightened biosecurity uh, risk prevention measures. And over time, travel will normalize. Um, mm. It's just really that we need to go through these birth pains and uh, we will need to just adjust our processes, our protocols, and uh, travelers will just have to adjust to a new normal uh, when they do uh, travel. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'm going to have to end it at that, uh, guys, uh, David and uh, Charo, but uh, allow me to say that uh, I'm glad to, to hear and know that you guys have kept the fight, you still are in the fight, and you are staying positive regarding aviation in the Philippines in uh, 2020, and that uh, you managed somehow to uh, keep your resources together to, to last this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, to last it uh, and uh, survive it. Okay, uh, thank you for your time, and uh, I hope you guys will stay safe, stay strong, and stay healthy. And uh, God bless you, all your personnel, all your staff, all the people that work for you, and uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Sita. Okay, that's uh, David De Castro of uh, Air Asia and Charo Logarta of Cebu Pacific. I basically had to pull back on that one. I, I confess because you know uh, we have guests, and you one must be polite when they are guests. But now that they've uh, uh, taken their exit, I have to say we cannot operate business this way. We cannot run things this way, where a company such as Cebu Pacific, Air Asia, and even PAL for that matter, are providing services. The last thing they need to, they have to do or should be doing is having to coordinate with politicians and local governments. That should be the responsibility of government. All of that has to be ironed out and all the policies there must be a single policy. Hindi po pwedeng kanya-kanya pagdating sa negosyo and corporation katulad ng Cebu Pacific at ng Air Asia at ng Philippine Airlines. I mean, you know, we are not operating jeepneys here. We are flying aircrafts. And those things are flown on the basis of schedule, on load, on capacity, on fuel, on personnel, etc. It costs millions per hour to operate, fly a plane. The last thing these people must be doing or should be doing is having to talk to individual mayors and governors who will then decide what sort of rules they need to follow before they will be able to fly into that area. I mean, the presumption is this airplane is going to fly into your city, into your uh, province, and make money. Sorry, they're not going to make money. They are going to lose millions of, ma of money, millions of pesos to operate so we can have a functioning economy. They're bringing in supplies. They're bringing in people who will bring business to your localities. You need to put get your act together and the same goes with the IATF. Please, if you have to go from day to day basis to run a country and manage a pandemic, I mean, you better get help. You better ask people, consult other people because you 
clearly forgot about the 18 to 21 people who are working, who are vital parts of the economy, who have families to feed. They either contribute to their family or are supporting their own family. But we completely forgot them and treated them as children. Stop infantilizing the Filipino people. Get your act together and work as professionals in government. If you cannot be professionals, get out of government. We have been in prison. That's the situation here. We have been in prison for nearly three months, and it is just really getting frustrating and annoying. I mean, imagine having to ask for a travel pass. I get it. There's a quarantine. I get it. But manage your communication well and manage people's expectations well. Wag po ninyong gagawin yung mag-GCQ kayo kasi napilitan dahil gusto raw ng business na mag-open ng economy. Kasalanan pa ngayon ng negosyante, kasalanan pa ngayon ng mga empleyado. I mean, your government, govern. Don't threaten don't scare us that if there is a surge, there is a second wave, you are going to bring us back to ECQ. Dati na po kaming takot. Huwag nyo na kaming takutin. I'm sorry. I'm just beginning to really, you know, get so frustrated. And I believe I am fairly representing the frustration of many Filipinos. You have two airlines here on the show who need to talk to different local governments, governors, and mayors to sort out whether they can fly in and fly out. They're going to fly in at a loss. They're going to fly out at a loss. The least that government can do for all the money they, co co they collect from taxes and revenues from these airlines is to iron out one policy. The least that government can do is if they are going to run this country, run it in a logical common sense based manner in any case we will go for a break and uh, when we return more of agenda You're back here on Agenda, and you are watching us on Signal TV channels 8 and 250 and the Facebook platform of One News PH. I'm Cito Beltran. And in case you're wondering why I'm, well, let's just say I'm pissed. Why I'm pissed? Well, you know, you hear so many things from certain government officials. Uh, you hear about certain policies. And then when you start investigating, you start asking you discover that the pronouncement is made even before the system is put in place. So as uh, we discovered, or you, you may have realized when I spoke to Yusek Densing, uh, yes, they're doing a lot of stuff at the DILG, but it has not been consolidated or organized. You know, one barangay can have one rule in terms of quarantine or lockdowns, and another barangay can have a different even the curfews can be are different. And, you know, I don't know. If, if I were the police, I, I would probably go nuts. You don't know. You, you have different times. What are we? America? 
we have different time zones for curfew. But anyway, the reason I'm also pissed is because yesterday I spoke to a friend of mine who has 150 employees. They are in a high level uh, construct uh, level. They are in a high level of construction uh, in the construction industry. And he told me that at the very beginning, when Department of Labor and Employment Secretary Bebot Bello announced that uh, they would be giving a stimulus package uh, and that people can apply for uh, assistance, his employees all applied. That was, I think, February, maybe March. It's now June. They got zero. Kahit po itlog, wala pa silang nakukuha. Now, Secretary Bellio might say, Sito, sino ba yan? I don't have to tell you who these people are. It's your job to deliver on what you said you would deliver. In any case, let's go to our next guest, Lawrence uh, Castillo, Program Coordinator of Migrante International. Lawrence, pasensya ka na, medyo na antala, uminit ang ulo ko. Good morning sa'yo. <laughs> Uh, magandang umaga po, uh, Sir Cito Beltran, at sa ating mga taga-subaybay. Okay, lo, lo, uh, ma malaman ko lang, no? uh, I have to confess, uh, many of us don't know or hindi namin alam, ganap na naiintindihan ang kalagayan ng mga nat nagtatrabaho sa, Pilipi sa Pilipinas, mga laborers or, or mga empleyado. What is the status of our laborers now or your the people you represent because of what's happened under this pandemic? Oo. Ah, uh, ginitong mga nakaraang linggo saksi naman yung ating uh, bansa no at ang buong mundo kaugnay doon sa mga problema ng mga OFW nating tinamaan ng COVID-19 crisis. Uh, umabot sa mahigit uh, 30,000 no yung bilang ng mga umuwing OFW dahil sila ay nawalan ng trabaho at uh, yung iba naman kasi ay mga nagsarado ng industriya o pansamantalang nag-break ng operations katulad ng cruise industry. No at sila nga ay na-subject at uh, na-stranded no sa Metro Manila no dahil sa maraming mga antala at problema kaugnay sa swab testing at kaugnay sa quarantine procedures. Okay, ngayon, uh, yung tungkol sa suporta, kasi yung nakausap ko nga kahapon, uh, 150 ang empleyado niya, nasa mataas na anta sila ng uh, construction industry, at sinabi niya sa akin, kuyang, eh, 150 yung mga empleyado ko, linggo-linggo, 1.5 million ang pinapaluwal ko, para masuportahan sila at ang kanilang mga uh, pamilya. And he said, I don't know how much longer I can do this. And, and yet, in, in contrast to that, itong promise, itong pangako na bibigyan namin kayo, sabi nung Dole Secretary, eh, yung bang mga kasama mo o nire-representa mo, eh, ano ba ang nakukuwang tulong? tungkol dito sa sitwasyon na ito? Well, sa bahagi ng mga OFWs, no, merong sinasabing Dole ACAP, no, isa sang cash assistance program uh, para sa mga displaced OFWs dahil sa pandemic. No, ang problema, limitado ang uh, saklaw at coverage nito at maging yung pondong inilaan para dito. No, yung first batch ay nasa 1.5 billion lamang no at uh, ang kayang abutin lamang nito ay sa pinakamarami na ay 150,000. Samantalang kahit mismo ang dole, sinasabi nila na aabot ng 1 million ang bilang ng mga kababayan natin na nasa abroad ang matatamaan nitong COVID-19 crisis. Kaya hindi talaga sumasapat no itong uh, hinandang plano at uh, tulong at ayuda ng ating gobyerno para sa ating mga kababayan na tatamaan ng COVID-19. Okay, ang nadidinig ko pa lang sa Dole ay may mga bumabalik na county. Sabi nila, una 4,000. Hmm. Yung 4,000 naging 24,000. Yung 24,000 ngayon magiging 42,000, naging 60,000. Ngayon meron na raw 100,000. 
Para bang kinokonti-konti ang reporting. Kayo sa migrante, alam ko naman, you have no filters. Ilan oh. ba sa pakiwari ninyo, sa palagay nyo, ang babalik na OFW na mga na-displace abroad? Kasi ang lumalabas sa dyaryo ngayon, ayaw umuwi ng mga na-displace. Pero ang oh. tanong, ilan ba ang na-displace at uh, malamang hindi magkakatrabaho at hindi makakapadala ng remittance? Uh, sa totoo lang hindi pa natatapos yung problema eh, no at yung impact ng COVID-19 sa mga OFW no kasi developing pa uh, sa ibang mga bansa ay hindi pa naaabot yung uh, peak o natatapos yung problema ng COVID-19 kaya patuloy yung paglaki ng bilang ng mga uh, OFWs natin na matatamaan ng krisis na ito so sa isang banda we agree no na abutin talaga ng 1 million ang mga OFW na tatamaan nito no pero uh, mahigit pa dito no yung mawalan ng trabaho kasi yung iba babagsak ang kita no dahil sa mga uh, salary cuts at iba pang mga austerity measures na gagawin ng mga companies nila no kaya uh, now on the matter of pagpapauwi uh, totoo yung binabanggit mo eh no uh, sir Tito na uh, masyado nilang minaliit sa totoo lang itong impact ng COVID-19 sa ating mga OFWs. No, si Secretary Bello noong February and March ang sinasabi nila uh, maliit lang or isolated lang yung bilang ng mga tatamaan at magkakaroon ng losses sa trabaho. No, pero ngayon nga dahil pumutok na at hindi na nila talaga uh, mapagtakpan itong tindi ng impact sakalang nila ngayon ina-accept no yung tindi ng epekto nito sa sektor ng mga migranteng Pilipino. Okay, we we're, we're talking about 1 million na mapipilitang bumalik. Uh, pero sa ilan ba sa inyong estimate or sa bilang ang uh, OFW, uh, actual OFW who are hmm. contributing to our economy economy directly? Oo, kung sa overseas Filipinos yan, to include yung mga undocumented workers, to include yung mga uh, under, uh, tawag dito, yung mga nagmamigrate papuntang Saba, Malaysia, no, at iba pa na labas sa, ano, sa uh, tawag dito, sa calculations ng ating government, maaari umabot sa 15 million no, overseas Filipinos sa buong mundo. Ganun, ganito nakalaki yung uh, nasa labas ng bansa ng mga Pilipino. At uh, okay. pwedeng umabot nga sa 3 milyon no, ang aabutin uh, ng impact ng, ano, ng COVID-19 crisis. Okay, now uh, sabi mo 1 million out of 15 million. Ngayon ang, ang, tanong, ang tanong ko sa iyo ay yung bang mga nasa abroad na yun, paano ba yung tama sa kanila? Kasi Iniisip natin, ah, wala na, may COVID-19 na dyan, ah, pauuwi na lahat dyan. Ah, gano ba karami sa kanila ang nananatili pang may amo, may trabaho ah, sa, sa inyong palagay? Kasi parang feeling ko, baka biglang mag na more than half of that. Baka instead of 1 million, mag 7 million yan. No, sa ngayon naka ano uh, at the very minimum naka standby na makauwi ang at least 100,000 no na mga OFWs na ilan buwan nang naghihintay na sila ay mapauwi ng gobyerno ng Pilipinas. No sila mm-hmm. ay stranded sa kanilang mga accommodations no uh, matagal na silang walang trabaho no mga no work no pay na ito at uh, uh, clearly tinerminate na sila no, sa kanilang employment. Pero labas dyan, no dahil nga sa impact nitong uh, COVID-19, maraming mga employers ang sinasamantala yung kanilang mga manggagawa, lalong-lalo na yung ating mga domestic workers. We have received reports na ang mga employers ay binibenta no yung mga domestic workers uh, domestic workers sa iba pa sa mga kamag-anak nila no para i then yung kanilang uh, ibinabayad sa kanila. No, at marami sa kanila gusto nang umuwi. No, they're not officially recorded as uh, uh, stranded no? dahil uh, wala pa naman sila sa mga shelters or technically they are still under the contract. 
no pero okay. gusto na nilang umuwi sa ating bayan dahil nga sa conditions na sila ay inaabuso at minamaltrato Okay, uh, ako ignorante talaga ako do sa ano yun, sa nasasakupan ninyo. Pero uh, a lot of us are under the impression that if you're an overseas Filipino worker, you are contribute contributing to the OF to the OWA fund and that the OWA fund runs into billions. Pero itong mga kamakailan eh dumadaing na si Hans Kaknak na kailangan na nila ng saklolo sa national government. Uh, and I even heard an OFW saying, Teka, teka, uh, what are you talking about? Eh, billion-billion ang pera namin sa inyo. Bakit uh, dumadaing kayo sa uh, gobyerno? No. Kasi sa totoo lang, uh, yung response no, ng ating government dito sa crisis na ito para sa ating mga OFW ay solely ay pinapabalikat no, sa mga OFWs. No, the OWA funds are OFW funds. Ito ay galing sa contributions. No? At uh, kahit yung swab testing na ginagamit para sa mga OFWs ay galing ito sa uh, PhilHealth contributions nila. No? O kaya naman sa bayad ng mga uh, manning agencies as part of their contractual obligation sa mga OFWs. Kaya sa totoo lang, uh, Sir Sito, Uh, yung ginagastos ng pamahalaan no sa pag-respond sa ating mga OFW ay galing din mismo sa kanila no at uh, wala pa talagang significant fund no from the national government no to help and assist our OFWs aside from the current program funds at uh, uh, OWA funds na na utilize na no for for the response of our of our government Okay. Well, uh, I, we've run out of time, uh, Lawrence, so I will have to leave it at that. Pero huwag kayong mag-alala dahil ako po ay may commitment din sa mga OFW at sa mga obrero that if we can help in one way or the other, this program will be there for you as long as we stick to the truth, to the objective, and to logic. And we hope that you and your associates will stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you. God bless din po. Marami pong salamat. Okay. That's uh, Lawrence Castillo, Program Coordinator of Migrante International. Uh, we try, we try, God knows we try, to get government officials to, to appear on the program to help us understand the same way that General Eliasar regularly guests on the show, the same way that Yusek then, uh, Epimaco then sing guests on the show, the same way that uh, Congressman Bebot Alvarez appeared, yet, and many others. But in general, we simply cannot get cabinet members to come to the program, especially if it is to explain on topics they feel might be controversial or they think in their mind, in their paranoia, could uh, cause them to get into trouble. So please uh, don't accuse us of being unfair, being one-sided, or being opinionated. Because Agenda wants first and foremost to give the news, to give the information. But in this situation, we can't even give the side of government because I don't know. Maybe they don't even know which side they're on. Thank you for watching us uh, watching us here on Agenda. I'm Sito Baldran. God bless all of you. Take care, stay strong, stay safe, and stay healthy.